Since the Velvet Revolution in 1989 that restored democracy and liberty to the former Czechoslovakia, after 40 years of repression and darkness, Ambassador Gandalovic has had a distinguished career as a public servant and a tireless champion of the Czech Republic and the potential of the Czech people. As an associate of the great Václav Havel, he helped coordinate activities uh, that brought about the Velvet Revolution to the regions outside of Prague, helping to give the budding freedom movement broad legitimacy by involving citizens from throughout all corners of the country, not just in the capital city. Ambassador Gandalovic uh, joined the foreign ministry as an advisor in 1994 before going on to head the information and economic section. He was appointed as the Consul General of the Czech Republic to New York in 1997 and served there until 2002. At that time, he returned to the Czech Republic to become mayor of his hometown, Ústí nad Labem, an important regional city near the border with Germany. In 2006, he was elected as a member of parliament and went on to join the government cabinet, becoming uh, the Minister of Regional Development and then later the Minister of Agriculture, uh, both positions involving uh, coordination and harmonization with the European Union. In 2011, he was appointed as ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States. And so now, for nearly 25 years following the Velvet Revolution, Ambassador Gondalovich remains just as zealous an advocate of his native Czech Republic and just as strong a friend of the United States as he was in those early transformative days of the early 1990s. In many ways, the relationship of the United States and the Czech Republic has matured and come full circle. The Czech Republic now has a well-diversified economy, a well uh, a stable democratic political system, and is a dedicated and reliable ally of the United States in NATO and a full contributing member of the European Union. On a personal note, as consul, honorary consul of the Czech Republic here in Utah, I've had numerous opportunities to observe Ambassador Gondolovich in action with members of Congress, with business leaders, with civic leaders, and he always, of course, makes a positive impression. You'd expect that of an ambassador. But where I've been most impressed has been uh, in the very sincere and personal touches that I've observed in his interactions with members of the Czech community, with students and with, just, and with regular folks, taking the time to engage with them, to, to listen, to spend time, the little interactions that won't get him much uh, airtime on CNN, but that have the uh, potential to inspire and to uplift and that can change individual lives. This was most apparent to me last April uh, when we were all witnesses to the tragedy in West Texas in which a major fertilizer plant uh, exploded in a massive fireball there, uh, flattening dozens of homes and, and businesses. Many of you may not be aware, that, but West Texas is a major Czech community. Uh, although West is a, a small town of only about 3,000 people, over 70% of the, of the town traces its roots back to uh, the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, following that, uh, that tragedy, Ambassador Gondalovich traveled to West to comfort those who had lost so much and to let them know that their friends and families in their distant homeland were still thinking about them and would support them uh, in their suffering and pray for them. And indeed, many of them cried on his shoulder and he embraced them. And I think uh, as, as one who's had uh, experience both as honorary consul and before uh, serving in the U.S. Foreign Service, I think we would do well to judge uh, men of high stature like Ambassador Gondalovich and other ambassadors, not by how they uh, comport themselves when they're dealing with presidents and prime ministers, but uh, how, they, how they comport themselves when they're dealing with bus drivers and school teachers, day laborers and retirees and university students. And on this score, I can attest that Ambassador Gondolovich really exemplifies some of the very best characteristics that uh, we expect of uh, BYU students here at this uh, fine university of which I am proud to be an alumni. Um, namely that Ambassador Gondolovich, through those experiences, and I mentioned West, West Texas, uh, is willing to, stand, uh, uh, willing to stand and mourn with those that mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. He's a great man and a great friend, and I'm pleased to introduce to you Ambassador Petra Gondolovich. Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, students. Uh, Jonathan, thank you indeed. Of course, uh, I don't even know if I should thank you because uh, flattering uh, introductions are tricky. 
they uh, actually higher the bar, uh, making it uh, uh, almost impossible uh, to meet uh, the expectations. So I'll do my best. In fact, um, I'm a former teacher. I uh, used to teach uh, mathematics and physics, and I know how is it difficult to keep track on time uh, of time uh, in the middle of the lecture and uh, uh, actually uh, squeezing all the subject uh, within uh, the uh, length of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, of the lecture of, uh, of of the class. So we have actually until uh, twelve fifty uh, to cover uh, such topic as the transatlantic relationship. Uh, I will try to speak of uh, rather the Czech experience, but I hope that uh, um, I will uh, provoke. Uh, your questions, and as I understand, uh, uh, quite a great deal of you have already been in the Czech Republic or wish to go and are interested in uh, things Czech. So why don't I just uh, uh, say uh, the transatlantic relationship uh, uh, may be dearer uh, to the Czech Republic than many other European nations. And why is that? Uh, I will try to give you some historic facts that uh, give evidence of uh, my, uh, my assertion. And I will go through these uh, uh, very quickly, so you can later pick any of those things uh, and uh, uh, raise your questions, elaborate uh, more on these. So in 1918, when uh, the First uh, World War was coming to an end, uh, of course the powers were discussing what to do with the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And um, you know of um, uh, uh, those 14 uh, conditions by President Wilson, and among them for us uh, number 10 was in, uh, extremely important, which called for autonomy of uh, nations within the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Along with that, President Masaryk uh, actually had already been in the United States uh, campaigning, uh, we would uh, even say today lobbying for the, uh, uh, for the consent of the United States uh, uh, of the creation of Czechoslovakia. And of course, we may have the tendency of, of uh, embellishing uh, the level of uh, friendship between the President uh, Wilson and uh, President Masaryk. Uh, obviously, history tells us that uh, there wasn't any kind of uh, mm, uh, personal bond. But on the other hand, uh, President Wilson was a principled man and uh, he recognized in Masaryk a man of uh, principles also. And he actually embraced the idea of creating uh, Czechoslovakia as an independent nation. So we always say that we owe to a great extent uh, the United States and President Wilson for our own independence. By the way, uh, just recently the statue of President Wilson was uh, re-established uh, in um, the city of Prague, so whenever you come to the uh, uh, city of Prague, you uh, probably may be traveling by train. There is this statue just next to the main station. So that was 1918. We always say that uh, the Czech history or Czechoslovak history is dotted by uh, AIDS. So we have uh, three subsequent less, uh, 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 less fortunate uh, AIDS, uh, starting with uh, 1938, uh, which was the, uh, the time of the Munich Agreement and the betrayal of uh, then allied uh, countries, the UK and France. And that date uh, probably was one of those mo uh, the most uh, changing uh, moments in the entire psyche of the uh, Czechoslovak nation and one of the beginnings of uh, uh, the leaning towards the east because as they said, we, don't, we no longer have friends in the west, we will uh, try to becoming friends uh, with the east. Uh, which of course uh, took its um, uh, practical form after the Yalta Agreement when uh, 
majority of the Czechoslovak uh, territory was actually uh, liberated by Soviet, uh, uh, by the Red Army. And uh, three years after uh, the completion of the Soviet dominance by the communist coup in our country. The third eight in a row is 1968, when after the, uh, the attempt to make this socialist or the communist regime more humane, uh, Brezhnev uh, lost his temper and sent his tanks, uh, his tanks to Prague, which actually was the end of the leaning uh, to the east and uh, uh, any admiration and uh, devotion or uh, maybe gratitude for the liberation uh, by the Red Army disappeared on that night, uh, August 21, when the Russian tanks rolled to Prague. So, uh, whence the where is this uh, transatlantic relationship uh, uh, at any of these uh, tragic moments? Unfortunately, we have to assert that the uh, U.S. was uh, mostly absent. 38, 48, and even 68, we couldn't mostly rely on uh, U.S. involvement in these affairs. Why is that? There is another story. But I will say that uh, one date is... Uh, maybe not that uh, notoriously, notoriously known, but it is, it is the beginning of the, of the change. And it's uh, 1975, uh, the Helsinki uh, Conference on um, Security and, and Cooperation. That conference actually resulted um, in uh, uh, the declaration on uh, security and cooperation in Europe and U.S was uh, very strongly involved then, and um, it was the, ch uh, the, uh, um, the Carter administration that actually, you know, we always uh, uh, are so grateful um, to Reagan, and that's very rightly so, because Reagan uh, stood firmly against the Soviet bloc and eventually brought it uh, to the knees. But it has to be acknowledged that the, uh, the, the, that the Carter administration actually introduced the human rights clauses in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Helsinki uh, protocol, which eventually uh, led to renewal of uh, human rights uh, movements uh, in our countries, particularly the Charter 77, the document that was published uh, just uh, 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 35, is that? Uh, 77, let me, 30, 37 years ago, um, that document literally called for the Czech government uh, to observe uh, on principles uh, which it uh, uh, itself signed for in Helsinki. So I already talked about um, Reagan and his uh, role in the end of the uh, of, uh, the, uh, of uh, the Eastern dominance of the Soviet Union. So then, of course, uh, 1989, uh, the Velvet Revolution, uh, Jonathan little embellished my role in that uh, process because you said that I was a mm, collaborator of uh, President Havel. I actually was uh, one of the three leaders of the Civic Forum. His uh, um, mm, creation, the, the civic uh, movement, which uh, uh, actually brought about the change. And I was one of the leaders in uh, the city of Usti. And uh, all of my interaction with uh, late President Havel was that I would travel to Prague uh, to get some, uh, some uh, new ideas, not to say instructions. So as, uh, as early as uh, in 1991, uh, Czechoslovakia sent its, uh, uh, its um, troops uh, uh, to Iraq where they, uh, where they fought uh, along the American soldiers. And I think that it was one of the uh, most important moments when uh, we actually realized that uh, the transatlantic uh, relationship, that is, uh, this bond is not only about ideas, it is about uh, sacrifice and about uh, 
um, maybe uh, responsibility in uh, crisis. So that was a very important date, uh, 1991, when Czechoslovakia, of course, along, along with Poland and other uh, former Eastern Bloc countries, sent their uh, military uh, to Iraq. Of course, then uh, we would uh, uh, stand along uh, the US uh, in Kosovo and um, in Afghanistan. 1999, that uh, is the time of uh, our uh, accession to NATO. We will actually uh, celebrate the 15th anniversary, and that one I have, uh, I have well, the 15th anniversary of uh, our accession to NATO. Today, we may think of uh, um, the enlargement of NATO as something uh, uh, rather routine. Since then, uh, a number of other nations have uh, entered NATO. And we may not even appreciate how, uh, how much it was um, difficult for the US, and it was the US uh, particularly, which was the driving force uh, behind the, uh, the uh, um, enlargement of NATO. Then uh, it had already been 10 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And yet the US was prepared to include these former nations into an organization that was the, that is and has been the backbone of uh, our security and allow them uh, to actually have uh, the same voice as the US itself. So it was a very uh, responsible decision and I always um, uh, uh, don't want, uh, I, I never uh, want to miss an opportunity to thank the, the US and to um, mm, uh, the senators, the U.S. senators who eventually passed uh, uh, the enlargement treaty that they were so responsible and politically uh, farsighted that they admitted uh, mm, the East, uh, former East European countries uh, uh, to NATO. As I said, uh, our NATO membership is not only about uh, uh, being part of the West. We have uh, participated in, uh, in difficult uh, decisions, in difficult and, uh, and um, sometimes uh, really hard, uh, hard uh, things to do, like uh, uh, going to Kosovo and uh, safe, uh, uh, safeguarding uh, uh, the situation there. In uh, between 2008, and 2009, another strong uh, transatlantic bond was about to be created between the Czech Republic in particular and uh, the US. As you know, in those years, uh, the Czech Republic together with Poland was approached with a plan that uh, parts of, mission, uh, of missile defense uh, system were going to be installed on our territories. And I wish to uh, concentrate a little bit on this, uh, 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 this event because it is a little bit telling uh, to what has happened to the transatlantic relationship. On one hand, everybody is, uh, has been happy in the Czech Republic that we are part of all this Western world. On the other hand, frankly, at the time of uh, uh, 2008 and 9. Uh, the overall uh, preparedness of the Czech public to bring sacrifice, even such a small and rather symbolic sacrifice, like allowing for the American radar to be installed somewhere in the mountains, uh, has dwindled. That's a natural uh, mm, uh, uh, phenomenon that at times of uh, less um, uh, uh, mm, less uh, uh, threat uh, from the outside, people start thinking that uh, uh, things like freedom and uh, security come for free and they are just uh, 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 mm, as natural as, uh, as the air we breathe. So at that time, 
the political representation of the Czech Republic underestimated uh, that phenomenon. And while uh, we negotiated with the US uh, about the installation of the radar, uh, at that time the Czech public uh, wasn't already that keen uh, to keep that uh, relationship uh, so strong and their ability to take such responsible decision uh, decreased. So we faced actually about 60, 70 percent uh, public opposition against this. Uh, nobody knows how that would have uh, developed because uh, uh, pretty much mm, most of the political representation, the then government was uh, heavily uh, and uh, strongly campaigning for that uh, uh, that decision. So it might have changed a little bit, but uh, you don't change 70 or 60 percent. So it might have somehow developed, but unfortunately, uh, as you know, the Obama administration uh, changed the plans and uh, the radar is not uh, going to be installed in the Czech Republic uh, anymore. So what's the future of uh, the transatlantic relationship? First, it is important. It is important uh, security-wise, it is important culturally, it is important economically. Second, uh, it doesn't come uh, automatically. Uh, both uh, the publics uh, in the United States and in Europe uh, has become wary of their own problems and do not appreciate the importance of uh, cooperation. Sometimes they actually make, mis make the mistake that they think that the solution of uh, our problems lay in isolating ourselves. Sometimes uh, they still live in such a uh, uh, paradigm that uh, the US and, uh, uh, and Europe, while they may be allies uh, uh, militarily or security-wise, are still competitors uh, uh, what mm, in the economics make uh, sense. Uh, they always think of uh, some kind of a zero-sum game. Uh, I sell or, the, or they, sell, they sell. But the point is that uh, then there are many other, uh, mostly Asian countries, that sell themselves, not us, not uh, Europe, no, I mean not United States, not Europe, but uh, there is competition coming from other ends. So the future of the transatlantic relationship lays in all three areas. Security cooperation in NATO, we really need to talk about uh, increased, uh, increased uh, European responsibility in this uh, per, uh, particular in financing uh, our mutual defense. Culturally, we need to keep that uh, uh, exchange going and I wish to uh, uh, thank you, the leadership of uh, your university for uh, keeping up such uh, ambitious uh, uh, European program and uh, for such uh, frequent uh, ex student exchanges because without real uh, uh, experience, it's theory only. And third, it's the economic operation, and that's the argument for, uh, for closing uh, the TTIP, uh, uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, trade and investment partnership. It's the whole array of problems that will expect us, but at the end of the day, we really need uh, to become stronger together against the competition from elsewhere. So. I hope I have uh, uh, not covered it all, but uh, maybe I have provoked a couple of questions and we still have some, uh, some time left for those. Thank you. Uh, we now have a little bit of time for questions, so please. Can I just ask? Okay. 
Go ahead. Uh, what took you from mathematics to politics? That was exactly the uh, uh, Velvet Revolution and my involvement in uh, Civic Forum, which, as I said, uh, um, was uh, actually a, a very uh, smart idea by Václav Havel, because he knew that uh, um, after the communist uh, regime, uh, people were rather suspicious about political parties. So he created this wide-ranging, uh, let's say, overwhelming civic uh, movement that included uh, pretty much everybody, except, of course, uh, uh, the communists. And uh, they, um, and uh, uh, young people, uh, got involved, and um, I was uh, uh, 25 then, and I became one of the uh, coordinators uh, in my own hometown, Ustina nad Labem, which is about 100,000 people. It's uh, a city northwest of Prague at the German border, so it's not that far to Prague. And as, as I said, uh, we used to have uh, all these coordination meetings, and eventually, of course, uh, uh, we prepared uh, uh, free mm, first free elections in 1990, and I ran for an office, and I became the member of uh, uh, the legislature of uh, then Czechoslovakia, the Federal Assembly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Well, why don't we go to someone else? Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, I uh, T tell us your name. I'm oh, sorry. I'm Ray my name is Renee Strof, and I am studying political science. Uh, my question is concerning your role as general consul in New York. It was mentioned that you served there until 2002. So I was wondering what your experience was after the 9-11 attacks, and if that changed any relations, just your general experience. Well, mm, it uh, was a very uh, difficult time for all New Yorkers, uh, for the United States as a whole, and of course for those of us who served there represented our countries. Um, first, uh, we, of course, uh, uh, mm, were sympathetic uh, to uh, the uh, American people uh, for the tragedy that, uh, uh, that happened. Secondly, as uh, someone who had lived in New York for almost four years then, uh, you become very New Yorker. So you love the city, and you mm, you get really sad, and uh, it gets to you yourself uh, seeing that city hurt so badly, and it happens to happen that uh, uh, you may even know uh, someone who may know someone who lost uh, uh, his or her life. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had two casualties. Uh, Czech Americans then. That was another role we had uh, as uh, uh, foreign consuls uh, to try to get an information as to whether our nationals were uh, victims of uh, the tragedy because uh, uh, first uh, they didn't even know the names and then uh, there were rumors then that uh, many uh, uh, undocumented workers might have been employed in cleaning services uh, in these two buildings because these were two major uh, big buildings and there was a lot of cleaning and these attacks uh, took place actually in the morning so there were rumors that uh, cleaning services might have uh, still uh, been there so it wasn't a case again we only lost uh, two Czech Americans, it was uh, very sad, but uh, again, for me, it was a very emotional moment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Voiles. I'm studying political science. Um, with immigration and asylum seeking from North Africa and other regions nearby being a fairly hot topic, um, I've been doing some research on it lately, and it turns out Finland has actually been doing a program where they allow asylum seekers that don't have all the necessary documentation to have DNA tests to prove that they are indeed reuniting with family. I was just curious as to um, what would be some current European attitudes that would either stand as a roadblock or could encourage other EU member states to take on, you know, possibly doing DNA tests for asylum seekers without documentation. 
Well, this is a very specific question. Let's say that uh, immigration uh, is still the mostly the competence of nation states in mm -hmm. Europe. So there isn't any uh, Europe-wide directive, mm -hmm. uh, any principle that the member states have to uh, have to comply with. So each member state may set their own requirements uh, mm -hmm. for uh, for asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. uh, the Czech Republic uh, has not very much been the part of uh, uh, discussions regarding uh, uh, asylum seekers coming from uh, Africa mm -hmm. because this is a very specific uh, element, uh, uh, phenomenon that starts in Italy mm -hmm. and somehow goes north and uh, the Czech Republic itself uh, mostly deals with uh, immigrants uh, uh, coming from the east. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, our strongest uh, 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 community, uh, immigrant community, of course, except the Slovaks, who are mm -hmm. our cousins, uh, is uh, Ukrainian and maybe Belarusian mm -hmm. and Russian. So this is where we uh, see some challenges, um, not that we wouldn't be following uh, attempts uh, to uh, mm, find uh, some equilibrium between human rights and security mm -hmm. uh, that other nations have been trying to, uh, to achieve. But again, the Czech Republic itself has been dealing with uh, some different uh, kind of immigration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Sam Dearden and I'm studying history. Um, following the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings, um, many Americans thought that uh, Chechnyans were from the Czech Republic. Uh, and the U.S. issued a statement that you know, clarified that and everything. I know that in American embassies abroad and in, d in different areas, uh, there is public diplomacy pro uh, programs that, um, that promote kind of intercultural exchange and information exchange between nations. A, is the, does the Czech embassy here in the United States have something along those lines, or is there any follow-up action um, to clarify that uh, Chechnyans are not, in fact, from the Czech Republic? <laughs> well, first, um, uh, I mean, it was an um, unfortunate uh, incident, and I'm not laughing about American, right. uh, I would say, ordinary people uh, being a little confused. Uh, about these things. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, uh, some people in the Czech Republic would have uh, troubles uh, uh, making difference between some states in the United States and whatever. But, well, let's face it, Chechnya and the Czech Republic, these are two different worlds for that matter. The second thing, um, what can we do about that? Of course, uh, that's me here. Uh, trying to talk to you, of course, uh, mm, since you've been to the Czech Republic for the most part, you don't need that uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, education. And we can do better, of course, and go to much more detail. And at the same time, we have to face that the American embassy in a country like the Czech Republic uh, has about uh, 250 people, mm -hmm. while my embassy has uh, 25 people. So. We have to rely on volunteers, and we have one among, uh, among us, your alumni, uh, the honorary consul, uh, Jonathan Tichy, who's been uh, very much uh, uh, a great uh, supporter and, uh, and a collaborator. So uh, we are stronger with these people all across uh, the, United uh, the United States. Thank you very much. My name is Joseph Smith, and I'm studying international relations. My question is, you mentioned specifically with you know, the Times of Peace that the countries feel more isolationist, that they aren't necessarily as willing to take vote or take um, role in the international stuff. Um, so reflecting on that with the European Parliament elections coming up in a few months, are there any plans or moves by the Czech Republic in particular or Europe as a whole to increase um, I guess the regular people's interest in uh, international issues? Uh, I think that there are a number of questions uh, in this one. First, uh, to what extent uh, people 
uh, get wary of uh, uh, war efforts and uh, get a uh, little uh, mm, tired and un unable or unwilling to uh, uh, to support uh, uh, some other uh, some other uh, actions we've been uh, observing this in the US the same thing in <coughs> Europe uh, we could talk at length uh, uh, about what's been happening in Syria and whatever but the point is that it's not only at the time of peace when peace lasts uh, long but it might be uh, r the result of uh, some long war effort and uh, the tiredness that it uh, it uh, necessarily brings so that would be one entire philosophical discussion to what extent uh, we have to uh, um, you know support uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, responsibility and that brings me to european affairs of course it's been the fact that uh, uh, the us has uh, actually uh, uh, bore on its shoulders most of uh, the load of nato uh, 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 nato financing and uh, nato activities and that should change also and it needs european commitment you know that uh, each member state of nato has committed to uh, financing uh, its defense by 2% of uh, uh, gdp and it, uh, it has not been the case except poland and greece we know why greece and we know why poland of course but uh, it should be it should be uh, normality uh, normalcy rather than a, a unique case and third, uh, the election to European Parliament, that would be a whole array of questions to what extent people really see uh, those elections as uh, the elections, the elections. And it's unfortunately not yet the fact that uh, uh, people are rather interested in uh, their national elections, uh, maybe perhaps even local elections much more than European elections. Yeah. The turnout is much lower, uh, the political discussion is much uh, shallower and weaker, the media do not cover it uh, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> so widely. So that's another part of the question. So I actually <coughs> re <coughs> replied your questions with uh, at least three questions back so that you have something to, to study further. All right, thank you. Hello, my name's Josh Steed. I'm an international <coughs> relations major. You mentioned uh, near the end of your beginning part that uh, the kind of the trading agreement between the nations was starting to weaken. <coughs> and uh, I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate more on some of the economic consequences if the trade agreement was by any chance disbanded between the United States and other European countries, or maybe in particular the Czech Republic. Well, let's make no mistake. There is no trade agreement between the US and European Union. Of course, we uh, all are uh, parts of WTO. Uh, the tariffs uh, themselves are uh, relatively low. They do not exceed uh, more than 4% uh, in average, uh, although there are some uh, sectors with uh, quite heavy uh, tariffs uh, still. But the point is that um, uh, the problem lays more in regulations and in mutual, uh, uh, mutually uh, accepted uh, or um, uh, recognizing uh, the regulations. I made this uh, very uh, oversimplified uh, point that you can't take your car and bring it over to Europe and drive it there because it's against the law, because you have a different uh, uh, color uh, of blinkers and uh, all sorts of different uh, tiny details that uh, mm, the authorities uh, uh, would require you to uh, sort of get your car, uh, mm, uh, you know, somehow uh, fixed that uh, they would uh, they would let it uh, 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 let it drive in European Union. So that's the problem. We have uh, so long uh, uh, regarded uh, each other. Comp 
competitors, uh, and uh, there is a good reason for uh, uh, doing uh, or um, making all these obstacles uh, from importing uh, cars from the US to Europe, because, uh, of course, uh, cars are uh, uh, less ex expensive in Europe, so uh, if you can't uh, apply tariffs, you apply all sorts of technical requirements, and here, here we are again. So the TTIP is actually not about tariffs. It is about conditions for uh, doing business, for, uh, for um, recognizing uh, certificates, uh, conditions uh, for investment, for protection of investment. Of course, we could talk about all sorts of legal problems uh, uh, concerning investment and, uh, uh, and sue, suing and whatever. So that'll be the bulk of uh, uh, the TTIP uh, negotiations, which will by any means be extremely difficult, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, it will bring a very positive result. Thank you. My name is Connor Kreutz. I'm studying international relations. Um, during the Syrian civil war um, in the beginning of 2012, the U.S. Embassy closed down in Syria, and the Czech Embassy was able to um, represent U.S. interests during that time. What aspects of Czech foreign affairs made that possible? Well, um, now I'm feeling like the, the, the jazz team trying to score 25 points in uh, less than a minute. <laughs> uh, so, uh, of course, uh, we were asked uh, to take over the protection of the U.S. interests in Damascus. The reasons why we stay in Damascus are uh, mostly that uh, we think that we know the territory. Uh, we are uh, relatively well connected there. Uh, we have not decided to pull out. Of course, that's a different uh, situation that the U.S. has. And uh, we gladly um, offered that we would uh, uh, serve as uh, uh, protection of the U.S. interests, and it's been the fact until now. Mm, fortunately, it has not uh, uh, created any uh, jeopardy to our to the security of our embassy there, and I think that it has uh, brought many important. Uh, um, important results for both uh, the U.S. and uh, as well as our diplomacies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, my name is Flaka Ismailia, and um, I study political science. Uh, my question is: um, You mentioned that that the Czech Republic has supported um, the U.S. in many cases, and uh, being a being part of NATO, uh, it's um, it has supported the U.S. For example, in Iraq and also in Kosovo. Um, how d has that knowing that Russia was really against Kosovo, like intervention in Kosovo? How has that uh, affected the your, I guess your friendship with the U.S. affected your relationship with Russia over time? Okay, another question that would take uh, <laughs> probably a lecture itself. Uh, in 1991, uh, in March, we became full-pledged members of uh, uh, NATO, assuming uh, the, among others, uh, the right to uh, cast a veto vote. In, I guess, uh, May, or maybe even uh, earlier than that, uh, this actually was debated uh, at uh, uh, North Atlantic Council. Of course, it wasn't easy for the Czech Republic because uh, not of Russian influence. Uh, uh, I think at that time we probably uh, didn't care much about what the Russians would uh, say, but uh, Czechoslovakia historically had uh, such strong ties with Yugoslavia, with all the nations in Yugoslavia. So we would be friends with the Croats, we would be friends with the Serbs. Unfortunately, the Croats and the Serbs uh, uh, had uh, or used to have issues. Yeah. <laughs> we used to go to, uh, to mm, you know, uh, uh, Yugoslavia, and we wouldn't probably even recognize who's who, not talking about uh, Kosovo. So the friendship between the Czech people and the peoples of uh, uh, former Yugoslavia has always been very strong, and uh, in this very uh, respect uh, the friendship between the Czechs and the Serbs is probably, I don't want to say that it is stronger than the others, uh, other relationship, but 
it's very strong culturally. And so it uh, really broke our hearts that uh, we were basically part of a campaign that uh, was uh, going to bomb Belgrade. But at the same time, you couldn't just uh, close your eyes before uh, what uh, kind of atrocities uh, did then Serbian uh, uh, representation allow for uh, uh, to happen in Kosovo. So eventually our, uh, our uh, position was yes, we didn't block uh, the campaign. We of course didn't participate because it was an air campaign. But eventually we became one of the strongest rep military representation in K4, in the Kosovo uh, stabilization uh, or force or how was it called? Thank you so much. Hi there, my name is Seth Trader, I study political science, and um, this is a bit more of a European question, but how would non-Eurozone countries like the Czech Republic like to see um, themselves represented in decision-making matters within the Eurozone, such as uh, things like the EBA or the ECB? Um, I think that um, we probably end up as uh, uh, sitting around the table without uh, voting right. That may be uh, the optimum we can achieve because other, uh, uh, otherwise we won't have uh, any influence at all. Okay. Hi, I'm Savannah Eccles. I'm studying political science. Um, the Czech Prime Minister has said that he would like to see the Czech Republic join the Euro in the next five to six years. Do you think that's possible in that time frame? Well, um, this is uh, this uh, new government uh, in making. So the prime minister has to uh, mm, mm, present uh, some political visions and plans. Uh, I think that the discourse about the uh, mm, euro in the Czech Republic has been little uh, going up and down. Uh, I can recall that uh, uh, in uh, 2007, before the crisis began, we were uh, really seriously thinking of joining Euro by the time we speak right now, or maybe even uh, earlier. And then the crisis came and the public support towards uh, Euro accession has very much disappeared. And then yet now we see uh, other um, aspects and uh, again I'm afraid that uh, uh, I, I, I don't know I've been told that you have other classes but this is a very interesting thing uh, you know that uh, uh, we always regarded the problem of uh, Eurozone as a problem of incompatibility of the economies that joined uh, the Eurozone so uh, there is a different uh, economic output or strength of Germany and uh, uh, perhaps uh, mm, uh, uh, perhaps France also, and uh, uh, Greece on the other hand. And uh, in the case of uh, the Czech Republic, if uh, things go uh, uh, not so well, uh, you can uh, devaluate and uh, make your economy more competitive. So. Uh, so far, the discussion in our country was uh, that it was a mistake for Greece that they joined the Eurozone because they couldn't devaluate uh, at the time of you know, economic crisis. And yet, our uh, uh, central bank did that very thing. It devaluated the crown by mere 10% or maybe even less than that. And if you follow the Czech media, it is interesting how outrage, uh, how much outrage this uh, step, uh, step created among ordinary people who saw, uh, you know, their uh, mm, their vacation expenses uh, going up, and among uh, importers uh, who have to pay more for imports and whatever. So that very discussion about uh, euro uh, that. Uh, actually uh, was in such a narrative that it is bad to be part of Eurozone because you couldn't take uh, 
mm, you know, uh, over your own things. You couldn't uh, uh, fix your inadequacies by uh, handling your own currency has very much changed at the time when the central bank did the very uh, same thing. It took the currency, it devaluated it, it uh, helped the economy by any means because we, uh, uh, we are very much uh, overwhelmingly export-based economy. Uh, you can see the figure that uh, in the US, uh, I think 30% of uh, GDP is driven or made by exports. In the Czech Republic, it's more than 70%. So we depend on exports much more heavily than, for, for instance, the US uh, does. And our domestic consumption is a lesser part of our GDP. So in this, uh, for that matter, devaluation was the right thing to do. But at the same time, of course, it hit some nerves and people got uh, uh, pretty angry against uh, the, uh, the chairman of the board of the uh, Czech National Bank, whom they didn't know before. That was not very well known public figure before and the ordinary uh, citizen didn't know the name of that guy who was the chairman of the board of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, bank, and now he unfortunately be became a little bit of uh, uh, you know media uh, uh, punching uh, back uh, since. So, why I'm telling you this: uh, adopting euro as a currency is a political decision that has to have support. Uh, uh, from within the nation itself. It cannot be introduced from the above. So we actually go through such discussions and maybe eventually we will be able to adopt the euro. Thank you. We've run a little bit into the overtime, but please join me in thanking Ambassador for his questions and his lecture today. Thank you very much. <laughs>